Thanks, Nahida. All right, I guess I'll have to start. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, all right, so Plato's apology is about Socrates. He is sort of the epitome of where the culture was headed. Athens was sort of the, the culmination of where the culture was headed. It was, there was always this effort to get people to think critically. There's no one and one, only one answer. So all the gods disagree with each other and we all understand that internal tension between all these legitimate passions. We have to be careful not to overreact. Then you had um, Hesiod telling stories about how men abuse their power in a patriarchy. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And then um, how when Zeus is unfaithful, he harms the god goddesses and he and they have children that are also psychologically crippled and then he wonders why he can't govern this <laughs> why they won't listen to him yeah as you sow so shall you reap mr zeus and if it's true of zeus the king of the gods it's going to be true of average joe king of men you know don't do this so uh, so we have talked about that the main thing here is, of course, the goddesses of Crete are out of the picture by now, right? You don't hear those stories, but I'll try to bring them back in in a minute. So we have mostly this is post patriarchy, right? And so, um, so we have Olympia and the apology refers to the Olympics. Socrates says, what do I really deserve for having lived the life I live? Well, I actually deserve to be fed, uh, paid for by the city for the rest of my life, just like the Olympic athletes. So the Olympic athletes got to get uh, provided for by the city. Um, and that's a question of honor, right? Remember, we always, Hera especially worried about and rational honor is knowing what's honorable and what a city should honor. And so Socrates is saying the city should honor me, <laughs> but of course it kills them. <laughs> that shows you about the corruption of the spirit of the time. But anyway, that brings in the Olympics. And then there was Delphi, that's a big deal. Socrates was um, trying to be a good citizen. So he went to the Agora, the marketplace, ask people, well, what do you think justice is? And what do you think virtue is? And he just kept asking the questions. And pretty soon people were exposed, like they hadn't really thought about it very much. So then his friend went to Delphi and, and asked the oracle, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? He doesn't say, and the oracle says, nope, nobody is wiser. And Socrates says, he doesn't say that I'm wise. He says, no one is wiser. And so Socrates says, it was a riddle, right? <laughs> Yay. The oracle gave him a riddle. And so he's trying to solve the riddle. So now he's determined to find somebody wiser than he is because he knows he doesn't know. And what I think, um, and so he, but he, what he does is he exposes the growing corruption and the extent of the corruption. Everybody's corrupt and they're proud of it. And they just call it freedom. They think freedom means the freedom to do whatever they want. So um, in the symposium, I talked about how Eros was corrupted. So they took their freedom and they developed this Eros. So the military was corrupted. The, it was worshiping Aries, um, just being machismo. Um, the legal system was corrupt. It was giving license to Aphrodite, sexual relationships. Um, the medical profession was corrupted because it was pandering to people's irrational diets and lack of exercise and making a lot of money off of it. The arts community was corrupted 
uh, comedians would get become popular just by um, vulgarizing people's tastes and feeding their resentments and mocking people out. Um, <coughs> and then tragedy was corrupted because people thought, oh, that's a good idea. The people thought that home, home, the, trage the tragedians were watering the emotions and encouraging the emotions rather than magnifying them in order to flush them out. The Athenians actually thought the poets were magnifying them and glorifying them. So they completely lost their ability to read or understand their tradition because they were corrupted, right? So people interpreted the stories and the tragedies like riddles. They interpreted them in ways that gratified their own and justified their own way of life. So then um, Socrates, Plato grew up in this city, Athens that was structured more than any other city to encourage this kind of critical thinking because it was based on the rule of law, a constitution and the voting of the jury. So there he is, he's the ideal citizen but the tragedy of underlying Plato's dialogues is that the tragedy of that the majority of Athenians could not tell the difference between Socrates and a sophist. The vote was close, you know? So a lot of people did understand that. It's just not enough. And so that's what Plato is saying to his readers. Like, if you have enough intelligence and opportunity and motivation. That's what you have before you ever will even be exposed to Plato's dialogues. You have to live in a society or be allowed to go to a university that doesn't censor Plato's dialogues because any authoritarian society would censor Plato. The Taliban would never want anybody to read Plato. <laughs> I think you understand that. Um, so um, if you are reading a Platonic dialogue, you are in a position of privilege, even though a lot of you don't think so. And But just in terms of your natural ability, your opportunity, and your motivation. And so what Plato is telling you is that you should always use the powers you have for the benefit of the people over whom you have them. Otherwise, your society will become unstable and it will more likely lead to more authoritarianism just to compensate for that instability. There will always be power hungry people who will want to step in. And, you know, I'll, I'll bring. I'll uh, make Athens great again, mega. I'll make Athens great again. And Putin has become an authoritarian leader because he said, I'll make Russia great again. And um, the Chinese, they go back to the golden age. We'll make China great again. <laughs> oh, geez. It just appeals to people's pride and their pride, really. Um, and it's, you don't want to do that. You want to always use the authority you have or the advantage. And, and I know that you do because I read your posts and I understand that. So I think I have a very captive audience. <laughs> um, so let's see. I, one other thing I wanted to point out was that um, I read this first when I was in 10th grade and I understood it because my father had spoken out against racism and marched with Martin Luther King. And he spoke out against the Vietnam War and people were calling him up and swearing at him on the phone. And my, um, my friend told me my dad was just about a communist. Because <laughs> if you questioned authority at that time, you were communist, right? And, you know, or nowadays it's more like you're a terrorist sympathizer or you're a whatever. There's always some label, 
you know, for the bad guys and the good guys. But anyway, when I read it, I understood it intuitively right away. It's like the story of my life. Um, and there were people who told my father, you have kids, you shouldn't speak up like this, you should shut up because you have kids and they're going to get, people are going to say nasty things about, you know, uh, they're going to be crippled, you know, they're going to be criticized because of what you do and blah, blah. But a lot of you have that, your parents have stood up for you. I, and I really think you understand this. Um so I'm going to ask you to all to give your own examples. I'm just trying to trigger you in, in, in case some of you it didn't register. But a lot of you have written posts that make it clear that you've lived through a lot of the same stuff. Um, so, um, oh yeah, I, my parents wanted me to, they liked that I liked Plato and all this stuff. But when I came to um, Lyon, after 9-11, uh, it was really pretty horrible because every year since then, the students get more and more conservative and they, they spot me. I'm one of those secular humanists. I'm one of those feminists. I'm one of those environmentalists. I'm one of those, I'm one of those terrorist sympathizers. I mean, yeah, I've run into some hostility and I would say there's there aren't very many students at Lyon that like my classes. They don't want to take them. Um, but even among the ones that do, when the parents come for graduation, they avoid me. <laughs> and I do feel bad because um, they have paid money and made a sacrifice for their children to get educated. And then they just think people like me corrupt their children and we're atheists and we don't believe in the traditional gods. And <laughs> it, you know, makes me sad because um, it just shouldn't be that way, right? I'm not a bad person. I don't sleep with them. <laughs> there used to be teachers that did do that until it was illegal. But anyway, so I'm going to give each of you a chance to make an analogy. Think of your own example of your parents are acting like Socrates or um, teachers, or maybe you spoke out at some point and had the courage to speak out. He has courage, you know, he has self control, he has rational courage, he has all those character traits of Aristotle. But I'll just let you talk right now. So, Rossi, did you come up with something? Um, no, actually, Professor, but I want to make a comment on um, Ratana's post regarding Kan Lai and her comparison to Socrates. Although I, I am Cambodian and it's something that is happening during um, that time when um, Gambalai was um, being an advocate for the political issues in Cambodia. At that time, I was not in my home country. I was in Italy, so I wasn't fully aware of the whole situation, um, his speech or the assassination and his comedy theories. But once I read this post, it actually made me realize that it was this had happened in Cambodia for over many centuries, like a lot of individuals were trying to speak up against the government or at least try to like open the citizens eyes, but they got silenced. And I think this is uh, one problem that Cambodians are facing of trying to ask for change because we can't, uh, we can't get changed when we are not allowed to speak our opinions and point out the flaws within our own government. And just like our meeting yesterday, we can see that a lot of um, uh, Americans were like always asking for change. They keep changing like their leaders like every four years. And we can see that I feel like they have corrupted themselves of that privilege for always asking for change. Okay. And so you were saying that most people are like Melitus and Anatus. They don't want people to question, right? 
Yes, Professor. Okay. So the majority of people would just rather, they'd rather believe their leader and have traditional, follow traditions, right? Okay. I think that's, that's what we were talking about. Um, Louis, do you have something? Um, yeah, I also want to comment. Um, in your stuff of Cam Cambodian, uh, the post that Cambodian student, right? Um, I still, I think Vietnam, some, some, as some certain, uh, it's the same with Cambodian. Uh, like, I still remember last year when US presidential election happened. Vietnamese people in Vietnam talk it about talk about it all the time, um, at school, in the workplace, or at home during the dinner. Uh, it's simply because in Vietnam we don't have the election process are public like that. Uh, in real, yes, we have the right to vote when we reach eighteen years old. But the thing is, it, the president is not decided by our vote. Uh, voting is simply something to show that it seems too fair in the surface. But in the reality, the government are manipulators. Um, the result is always nearly 100% and is clearly not credible. So um, there are many rules in Vietnam that if we speak against government, no matter in the social media or in the street, we will be fined heavily or be arrested. So no one, I think no one dared to question again the government, like the same happened with Cambodia, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I, I just wish Americans would uh, value their freedom and not corrupt it, right? Because we're making ourselves unstable just because of our notion of democracy, like the government can't tell me to get a shot the government can't tell me to wear a mask, right? It's freedom, right? Freedom to make other people sick and die. It, it is totally crazy, but it's straight out of book eight of the Republic. Uh, drives me nuts. Does that make sense to you, Louis? Yeah, I, I think that in the US, we, we have too much freedom and in the names we, we have blessed or at least right. don't have freedom to do that. Yeah. So yeah. we need to balance. Right. And that's what they say in book eight, right? Too much yeah. freedom. And so Athens itself, the city at that time, people had too much freedom and they were about to do to fall into authoritarianism. But I think that's what happened to Plato. Like what he's telling us is in 30 years, you can go from having a really flourishing democracy to authoritarianism. So every single generation has to pick up and do what they can to prevent authoritarianism, right? And even though a lot of you live, I mean, for those of you who live in an authoritarian society, then it would be to try and make your societies more accountable, right? to try to move it in a direction where there's more informed people and there's more citizen engagement, right? I mean, that's just, it's just a matter of degree because there's only so much you can do. And, um, but there, you know, things can always get worse. <laughs> and so everybody who has the privilege to read the books has the responsibility to do what they can, which is, you know, you always have to remember what I can do, right? Not what really needs to be done, but okay. So Rupia, do you have something? Okay. Margia, do you have something? Okay. Madeline, do you have something? No, ma'am, I don't. Okay. May, do you have something? Yeah, actually, I want to further evaluate on Louis's uh, comment before, because that is actually what I also want to say. Um, 
basically I wanted to um, relate the fact um, the fact that Liz said before to the importance of education. You know, actually, I feel um, it's in Vietnam, the issue in political system is not just about the unfairness in um, in voting and also during the voting process, but actually um, we, we, we have never been educated on polit political matters like for the whole school schooling years, like from primary school to university. Um, actually, because now I am AJW, so the thing is different, but for like most of friends I have in Vietnam, they study in a public university in Vietnam and um, regarding politics, they are just taught to um, about Marxism and kind of like that. They, um, but, at AUW, um, I have the chance to like approach to difficult, uh, sorry, different like political theories and ideologies um, in different classes. So I, I see like a broader view, but for people here, it's like um, the government and also educational system don't want them to like approach to different or like new ideologies. So, and, and even like, for example, my family, like they know nothing about politics and they also don't know the existence of many different ideologies. So kind of when they vote or like um, they do something related to politics, they just do it like um, without ra Russian and like just like, I don't know, but I think that there will be always problems with their awareness regarding like every like political issues and I may have a bit like pessimistic view, but I feel that there would, it would take like a long time down the road for Vietnamese to really like, um, to really fight against like authoritarianism um, and also to train. Because now I feel that like education like doesn't like help people understand and access to different like um, ideologies and approaches kind of like that. Um, and also, that is also why I want to like um, be an educator in the future and I'm still trying to learn to educate myself on that because I want to like, um, I want to help the next generation to like get access to different things and also to question every small things like they expose themselves to in, uh, in their daily life rather than following something blindly, kind of like that. So that's what like my comment. Good. That's the examined life, right? And Socrates. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, I think it's just, I just thought it was so great that I could actually understand those great books, right? Um, yeah, great books aren't that hard to understand, actually. A lot of other stuff is harder. Because and once you figure out what it says, it's not that important. <laughs> but the greatest books, you can get it and you understand that it's profound at the same moment. So um, so more. does everybody else understand why May would want to become an educator? I hope so. And then the other thing is um, you do have to take a lot of classes that you didn't plan to take. And sometimes the ideology is difficult to follow, um, but at least you get exposed to a lot of stuff and a lot of ideas. And I, a lot of my students after they graduate, they say, I don't even remember Dr. Beck, all the stuff we read. All I remember is by the end of the class, I was thinking at a totally different level in a totally different way. That's what they remember, like they got out of the cave, right? That's the idea of the cave. Um, so that's really, you can, if you want to write your final paper on, you could go back to the mission statement of AUW, which I, I posted. Um, and then you could write on that if you want to, um, because really there is a mind behind all these requirements and stuff. There's an idea. Okay, Elizabeth, what have you got? You got something? Um, yeah, uh, it's just kind of a comment of something that I liked. Um, 
I like that Socrates' whole claim is that he's doing this so other people can realize it and make a change. Like he's not doing it to corrupt the youth like they think. He's doing it to like influence other people and they don't realize that. They just think that he's like crazy or like corrupting the youth and uh, against the gods and all this. But he's like, nah, bro, I just want to make a difference. Do you have, do, I mean, this is the first time I've ever read the Phaedrus and then the Apology. And it just comes across differently, right? Because we've just seen this battle between Socrates and a sophist for Phaedrus' soul. And then right away, you know, he's being accused of being a sophist. And it, I just, no. Does that make sense, Elizabeth? Uh, yes, it does. Because, you know, Elizabeth has read this before, and I apologize, but I'm telling you, every time I read it, it's in a different light, you know, in a different context with different students. So it always comes to life in a different way. So do you feel that way? Uh, yeah, it definitely feels different reading it after Phaedrus. Okay. Okay, is Sam there? Uh, no, ma'am, she actually had to step out and take a phone call real fast. Okay. All right, Poppy, do you have something? No problem. Okay, news rot. Okay, L. Hello. Yep. Yep. Um. So I think the 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 first thing I got off of the apology, at least, is, um. When he's talking to, to Miletus, Miletus. Um, oh, whatever you want. It actually doesn't sound like that at all, but that's why you might as well mispronounce boldly. Uh, he's not as, uh, he, it, it's, it's a different cross-examination than he does in his other dialogues. And he's not as much trying to prove anything to Miletus. He's more just trying to get what he's saying out there. And I think that's kind of speaking to how he realizes that no matter what, he's not going to be absolved of this crime that they're accusing him of because he's being scapegoated already. Uh, the, the whole trial is going to be a sham. They don't want him running around anymore, so they're going to get rid of him. So instead of trying to convince him that he's innocent, he's just saying his feelings so it gets saved to the public record and people can know this is what happened here. And I think that's a very noble thing to do, where instead of trying to save himself, he was preserving this message so that it can be passed on. Yeah, and it was Plato that wrote this story, right? But, you know, it must have been pretty impressive at the time. Actually, given that that was what he was thinking, he did say he was kind of surprised that the vote was as close as it is, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's true. Considering all the false rumors, there were a lot of people that, that really were thoughtful. And then I also like how it uh, ties back to Delphi, where um, <laughs> he got the, the oracle that you are the wisest of all. And instead of letting it get to his head and going around Athens saying, I'm super smart, so you should listen to me. He's going around the Athens saying, I don't really know everything. So I'm trying to make sense of it all. So since everyone else doesn't really know anything either, you should question a lot and try to make sense of it for yourself. But that's a very dangerous idea for people in power because if you have people questioning you, you can't do whatever you want. He doesn't say, the Oracle does not say Socrates is smart. Uh, Caiaphon said, is there anyone smarter? And the Oracle says, no. And so Socrates says, if that's true, then nobody really knows anything about anything because I know that I don't know it. <laughs> Does that make sense, Al? That's very different than saying. Yes, yes. Um, and I also think, honestly, what he means is when he gets up in the morning and he goes out to the agora and he knows he's going to be asking people, what is justice? What is virtue? He also knows he has no idea what they're going to say. 
And he knows that if he's going to be just, it means that he will ask a question that will try to get this person to, to move toward the light rather than the cave. But to know that much is to basically know nothing, right? Does that make sense, Al? Totally. Okay, good. Uh, because it's a dialectical process. He has no idea what they're going to say. He has no idea what C is going to say. He has no idea if they're going to change their mind. He has no idea if anybody around there is going to change their mind. And, um, and he knows that he doesn't know. And that's true today in the US, right? Um, I just, I really think Socrates is a good model for getting over polarization, which is really hurting our society. First of all, he starts by asking people what they think, right? That's the beginning of getting over polarization is that you ask and you listen. Um, and, but then, you know, people do have to take responsibility for the consequences or implications of their opinions. But um, I do think that um, there are professionals who study how democracies degenerate into authoritarian societies. The first step is to polarize the people because if the people can't get along, then uh, a power hungry person will say, well, just vote for me and I'll take care of it for you. And I'll bring back law and order. And so I do think Socrates was a way to avoid that. He's a good role model, which is the paper that I wrote. And again, you don't have to have read it, but it's there in case you ever have time to read it. It brings in Plato and Aristotle and why they're so important in the United States today. And it brings in some other intellectuals who are very worried that our society is gonna degenerate into authoritarianism, which I am really worried about too, but. Okay, Untari, did you come up with something? Okay. Uh, Bondona, did you come up with something? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Jana Tool? Do you have something, Jana Tool? Okay, Aspina? Jereen? Aspina, do you have something? Um, okay, Rupia, Margia, okay. Um, all right, so the next point um, I was getting to was the image of the cave. Um, okay, so Jana Tula has a microphone problem. Okay, that's, that's life, don't worry. Um, if you wanna type something in, you can. Um, so the next thing was the image of the cave and the teacher is somebody who pulls somebody out of the cave. So people are basically chained uh, and they have to look forward and there's a light coming in from outside and it's casting shadows on the wall of the cave, but that's all they know is the shadows. Now, um, I wonder, did any of you, did anything come to mind for any of you? Because I guess I'm gonna, well, okay, I'll wait for a minute, see if somebody thinks of something. Um, Go ahead, uh, somebody speak. Okay. I think it's kind of poignant, poignant, po poignant, po oh, you know. Poignant, poignant. poignant. Uh, <laughs> how when the one that exited the cave, when he comes back and tries to tell the others about what he saw out there, they think he's totally crazy. And, and 
for him to explain it too. And then, so when you have like this knowledge that you, that you acquire, you, it's hard to just tell someone about it. You really have to show them because people are kind of stubborn and set in their ways. So these people have only known the shadows their entire life. And the thought that something besides shadows could exist is, is wildly uh, out there to them. Well, what I was thinking was patriarchy, right? There are just so many people in your countries that only know male domination, right? They can't envision a world where women are equal. And so I think that AUW is sort of designed to be the place outside of the cave, right? And so then the students come there and they create this whole culture that is unlike anything that people back home ever experienced, right? And then you try to go back home and you feel like nobody understands this, right? Um, so that was what I had in mind. I'm just going to ask the students, does that make sense to you? Or do you have any other examples where you feel like I've seen something, like I know what I'm capable of, or I know the kind of relationships between young people, uh, respectful relationships based on a common sense of purpose or something that nobody in my village has ever seen, right? They, how do I explain this to them? Um, so anyway, I'm just going to call your names and see if anybody, if you want to say, yeah, that's, that's what AUW is like, or if you want to just come up with some other thing on your own or um, whatever. I think, I don't know how many of you ever spent any time on campus yet, um, but definitely one of the students said that some of you are feeling like overwhelmed please don't quit, okay, whatever. Find a way and contact some people and um, make sure you just hang in there. Um, so that's the main thing. Okay, so any, I'm gonna just call your names about, did anybody come up with something when you heard about that image of the cave? Uh, Rossi, did you think of something? No, Professor. Louis, did you think of something? Um, no, Professor. Okay, Madeline? No, ma'am, I didn't. May? Uh, also no, Professor. Okay, Elizabeth? Um, we talked about this in one of the other courses I have with you, and this is the thing that I always think is ignorance. Okay, good. Um, do you want to elaborate on ignorance? There's so many different kinds. Yeah, kind of in the sense that um, pe people refuse to be to find the answer for things. And that just they're ignorant about their ignorance, if that makes any sense. Like they refuse to see the truth. And they're just blind and ignorant. Okay. Um, I remember after 9-11, there were people who used that event to deliberately create a completely false narrative about our founding fathers, because our founding fathers were <laughs> Christian heretics and political revolutionaries. They were not conservative, <laughs> but you know, just create this huge uh, false narrative and they knew what they were doing and they did it to get votes and to get um they constructed a narrative about saddam hussein when he was not involved in it at all because they wanted to go and invade um and so i felt i felt like people were getting jerked around and they were i was really mad at the people who created all these lies um, but then after a while, a decade or so, I felt like people aren't trying to think critically, right? They sort of like being jerked around. They like being manipulated. So 
that, you know, in the end, I still blame people with power the most, but I do wish people would try. Does that make sense to you, Elizabeth? Yes, ma'am, it does. Those are different kinds of ignorance, right? One of them is just to ignore public affairs because you're not affected by it. And then as all of a sudden, to sort of deliberately want to oversimplify just so you can feel better. That's a different kind of ignorance. Um, all right, is Sam there yet? No. Okay. Oh, let me see, I gotta make sure. Did Jana Tool come? Yeah, she came, right? Yep, okay. Oops, I got the wrong day here. Um, so DT, DT came late. Okay. Um, anybody else? Let's see. Poppy, Newsrat, Untari, Bondona, Jana Tool. Anybody want to talk about the cave? It's a very famous image in liberal arts education. Okay. And the last one is that little section. Oh yeah, okay. So Untari said, I heard about the cave story before in another philosophy class. The people in the cave were even planning to kill the person who would take them out of the cave because all they know is how their friend lost his sight in the dark after going out of the cave. It's like people are afraid to get out of their comfort zone. That's right. Um, and so again, that has to be something that you sort of commit yourself to. Um, uh, Martin Luther King talks about Socrates and he says that Socrates uh, makes people uncomfortable. And I can actually send that quote to you because again, you might want to use it in your final paper. So, um, so does anybody want to talk about that? Getting out of your comfort zone, do you, the people you live around just really create a worldview and they will believe anything be that makes them feel comfortable. Does anybody want to talk about that? Espina or Jareen or Rupia, Margia, DT, Jana Tool, anybody? Okay, and so the last point was the democratic personality. Um, so let me let me actually do a share screen with this, and I'm going to read it to you. And and everybody needs to say something. Okay. Um, all right. So what page number was that? I got it written down here. Um, page 23 at the top. Um, I remember reading this, of course, I'm going to school. I was going to school when we invaded uh, Vietnam. Okay, so those of you from Vietnam, I think we were there for, we called it freedom or blah, blah, protecting against communism, but it really was uh, imperialism, American imperialism. My father spoke out against that. So it is really, really amazing that now I am teaching people from Vietnam after this, it's this kind of stuff, Plato, and the corruption of democracy that I was applying to our behavior toward Vietnam and Cambodia. And maybe May or Rossi or Louis would want to write about that because it is pretty amazing the way that history, um, the way the generations sort of replace each other. And on the one hand, they just carry that history forward. But on the other hand, you, you all will have a very different life, right? Extremely different than your grandparents or your parents. But it's just that's the way human history is. There's the similarities and differences, and there's the, at any one point, we can all fall back into a pretty primitive level of sex and aggression. And so we really have to be careful about that. 
Here's the democratic personality. He lives from day to day, indulging the appetite of the hour. Sometimes he's uh, drunk, right, and plays on the flute. Sometimes he, um, he goes on a diet. Sometimes he stuffs himself. Sometimes he starves himself. Sometimes he goes and tries to exercise. Sometimes he just sits around. Um, every once in a while, he'll try to be philosophical. And every once in a while, he'll try to get involved with politics. But he does whatever he feels like, whatever comes to his head. Um, sometimes he admires macho warriors. Sometimes he admires businessmen that get rich. And there's no law and order. He never concentrates on anything. And he calls that freedom, right? <laughs> no? Does that sound like Americans? <laughs> How many of you think that sounds like the people in the United States, the way they're presented? Anybody? You know, they'll they'll go to, you know, they go to sports events and they have all this entertainment and then they go and bomb somebody and then they, you know, they just do whatever they want um, and call it freedom, preserving freedom. Um, and what happens is, I think it's really amazing. How does tyranny arise? Well, one thing is that everybody gets into debt because they spend money and they don't make money and they don't save money. And so gradually, um, they start going into debt, even people that previously had been fairly affluent. And so then they want to find someone to blame. <laughs> um, so children don't have any respect for their fathers and um, uh, teachers don't respect students. And I think Americans sort of have a reputation for this. I know I had uh, students from uh, foreign students a number of them were actually from the Mideast, and they said they could not believe it when they went to the homes of the American and that the American kids called their parents by their first name. Oh my gosh. This one kid said, my dad would beat me up if I called my mother by her first name. <laughs> like That's so disrespectful, right? So um, it's just, Cultures are like that, but it is interesting that, you know, it's a straight out of the Republic. Um, let's see, uh, what's, okay. The excess of liberty leads to the excess of slavery. And one of the main things is, is going into debt. And I think that's interesting because of course that's a big problem in our society. And then uh, people want to blame the rich and they want to go take the money of the rich. And then this strong man comes in and he says he's the protector of the people and he has a mob entirely at his disposable, at his disposal. Um, anyway, so the thing about, the thing um, that I don't like, however, is that I do not like it when uh, Americans refer to the Trump um, followers as the mob. I really hate that because if you talk to each of those people one-on-one, -on -one, just talk to them one at a time, they have a worldview that makes sense. And so I can easily picture in the small town where I live, why it would make sense to a reasonable person to vote for Trump. So the stereotype that they're all like the mob that stormed the Capitol, you know, some of them are, and some Arkansans are there, but you know, a lot of them aren't. And it really is not helpful to call them a mob. That just triggers uh, polarization. So I, I do not think educated people should ever label people like that. 
they should understand that they have their reasons. And if you talk to them, you know, you should be able to empathize. I think underneath all of it is a desire for your children to have the best life possible. And there's a lot of white working class people that really feel like they're going with Trump because they think their children will have a better chance at a better life. And Trump has set it up that way for them to believe that. I don't think so, but it's not an easy argument to make. And it takes, you know, it takes persuasion. And it, it is not easy to convince someone of that. And in the end, I'm just sort of betting on it uh, because uh, what's behind the Republican Party is just a lot of really, really wicked, really, really rich people. Um, but they're hiding. And it certainly appears that, that these people, for the sake of their children, they will do things and vote for Trump and put up with a lot of disadvantages if they think their kids will get a better life. So, you know, I think it's complicated, but um, I really don't like it when you talk about a mob. That's terrible. Um, so I am going to list names here and see if anybody has any comments. Uh, how about just some final comment on Plato? And then we'll move on to the final paper and the post that I gave you on that. But it would be nice if everybody would give some wrap up comment about Plato, Socrates, um, how it's sort of the culmination of this whole development of the culture, how you can understand now why Greeks are considered the foundation of Western culture even though Western culture has totally changed since then. Um, I hope you can understand how this was the origin, but it got corrupted. It's totally corrupted. <laughs> but um, anyway, just understanding things like that, I think is important. So Rossi, do you have any final word on Plato? Yes, Professor. Um, I just want to say that Socrates and Plato and all the found like the founders of um, politics and philosophy, I think they are the most important people who have set like an example for what it's like, um, especially for Socrates, he sacrificed himself. And although like not a lot of people in like Asia knows about Socrates, but what he did to sacrifice himself for the betterment of Athena and to, um, educate Athenians about what, like the situation they are living in. I think it's really important because it allows other people to see his bravery and see that changes can, can be made. Well, I really honestly think Ratana's paper is just as good as reading Plato's Apology, right? Mm -hmm. it, I mean, a it's lot like spot of them, on. it is spot on and it's so well written. So um, I wish I could get it published somewhere where a lot of um, Cambodians and Vietnamese people and maybe a lot of other people would read it because they would learn a lot, right? Because if they knew who Kem Lay was, then they mm -hmm. could understand that. And then they could go back and read Plato's Apology if they want to, but um so when I tell you that I, that I value what you all write, I really mean it, okay? <laughs> you are capable of writing some really profound stuff that could really make a difference. Um, you don't have to be old. Sometimes once you go to grad school, you hi hyper-specialize and you've sort of lost your intuition um, and it just becomes too specialized, but... Um, yeah, so that's, if you can find a way to just pass on the good word, Rossi, that would be great. Yes, definitely, Dr. Beck. So, Louise, did you have something? I think uh, for him later, um, 
we can like easily see the re reflection of the of the regimes in today in today political like we may say that democracy is the bad regimes for all people but now i think we must to we must question the character and the benefits of democracy bring to us um i think um it's better for us to uh, balance between our desire, uh, our logical reasoning, and our spirit, spirit, spirituality together, so we can make uh, us become a, like a better person and make a difference in the world around us, especially in the political, um, political, political work. Okay, good. What I think, yeah. Um, Madeline, do you have something? No, ma'am, I don't. Okay, May? Yeah, I think that um, Plato and even like um, Socrates or kind of like that, like they, um, how to say that, like I try to arrange my thought. It's like, I think that um, they don't like offer us an absolute answer or something, but it, like they create a foundation for us to reflect life, to examine life, and also to even I think to stimulate like critical thinking about every aspect of life, and it kind of respects the indi individual like um difference and like encourage people to like uh, dig deeper into the, ph the philosophy of life, kind of like that, and. Um, I think it's very important. It's like the example you said before about like um, you don't agree with people calling Trump supporter as mob. I think that it's very important. I think in even Vietnam or like in every part of the world, like instead of like generalizing a group of people and calling them um, uh, um, some some titles kind of like that, we should have like the conversation and also try to understand their background and what shapes them who they are and together like we can find like, solutions for different problems we are together facing rather than like calling people who like have different work um, work views with us like a, um, a bad title or something kind of like that so that's my comment okay good uh, elizabeth Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Will you repeat the question? Oh, it's just kind of like your wrap up on Plato this time around. Oh, this time around. Um, I, I think that Plato is important in the sense that it gives us an idea of kind of what the conversations were like, um, but also, there are some aspects of Plato's, like especially his Republic that I just really don't think could ever work. Oh, actually he throws out that city in book two through four. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, I appreciate that we can learn a lot from him. Well, I it really gets misread. All, all it means to work is that he would have convinced Glaucon to stay in school rather than go play politics yeah so it's not so the idea is if you can't convince the next generation of privileged kids to think critically and not to abuse their power that's it <laughs> does that make sense elizabeth yes ma'am it's not creating this utopia and all that stuff at the end of the republic he says this is the real question that you take the gifts you have and dedicate yourself to wisdom. That's the ultimate question of life. That's what he wanted him to do. If you can't get kids in the privileged class to do that, your city is toast. <laughs> um, okay, Poppy, you got something? News Rot, do you have some reaction to Plato? Al, do you have something? Uh, I, 
I think what I take away personally the most from from Plato and Socrates is the whole notion of the of the tripart soul and how it's this thing that we have and the tripart soul it's a uh, its ratios are different as far as desires and stuff like that goes to every individual person and through introspection through critical thinking we can develop our souls uh, we can develop society better and it's less um, a very big uh, nebulous philosophy it's more applicable to the to the human philosophy and I, I, I think uh, we lost that a lot especially when we move towards things like enlightenment philosophy where it's it's so out there that it really doesn't apply to uh, what it, we were originally talking about so I think going back and looking at stuff like Plato is important because we, we can actually apply these these concepts and we can see things um, well, we can see how the benefits of it. Okay, good. Um, Untari, do you have something? Bondona? No, okay. Asbina? Okay, Jareen? Okay, Rupia. Okay, Margia. Okay. DT, do you have something? Nahida, do you have something? Uh, yes, Professor. So, okay. Bangladesh is a democratic country. But now it already turned into an authoritarian government. Same person is governing uh, for 11 years. Gradually, uh, we are losing freedom of speech. People uh, are scared to express their feelings because if someone makes any comments, then they're accused as a traitor. So uh, for a better society, I think we need, uh, what do we need is to care about others' opinion. Actually, I feel need of a person like Socrates in this era. Good. That's great. Um, so I can't remember if you're behind in your posts, but if you wanted to write on Plato instead of someone from before, that would be great. Um, I did make the students last year do more work. I made them write a paper on Hecuba and a paper on Plato. Um, so, uh, you know, COVID, it's just too hard, I think. It was so much, I think it's easier when you're just sort of going to class and you're living it. You can get ideas better. You can get focused better. But if you want to, I would love to read a few more papers about Plato and Socrates and how, how my students at AUW apply it because it is fascinating, obviously. Um, John Atul, do you have something? Okay, Fahima, do you have something? Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is talk to you a bit about the final. And I do want the AUW students to come to the next class um, during class time and just come with ideas about what they think they might um, do in their final. So let me see. Yeah, here's the post. I'll move this post up um, so that you, you know, can keep track of it. But here is are some ideas. Mostly it's if you have an idea of your own, that's always the best because you know what you learned. But if you want to go, um, if you want to go back and check out the mission, right? To educate Asian women to become motivated professionals, leaders, service oriented citizen, uh, develop um, intercultural understanding, right? Among the people of Asia. So, 
So you could say, well, actually studying Greek culture and studying Aristotle's virtues is really good for developing intercultural understanding. If you wanted to do that, you could because every major religion focuses on those virtues. Um, the residential community thing, you could say, well, yeah, again, the, the Greeks understood the importance of community and conversation and dialogue. Um, and then the fact that you have different cultural and religious backgrounds, um, student-focused learning environment, uh, humanities, natural and social science, a broad base of inquiry, um, learning depth, right? And so again, you could just take that mission statement and show how studying the Greeks fulfills the mission of AUW. Uh, you can also link it to um, Lyon College's mission statement because that shows you that liberal arts education across the world and across time. And ever since Plato, probably before Plato, but Plato started the academy and Plato's dialogues were a major part of the curriculum of the academy. So if you write about you know, the Greeks, because Plato is writing about the Greeks, he's not just writing about some brand new thing. Um, but if you write about the Greeks as um, a foundation for liberal arts education around the world and for 2,500 years or something, and you wanted to just bring in the various things that you stuck out to you in your mind about the class, I think it'd be great. And I do think, you know, it's very general. So you do need to meet, to meet with me because together we can work out some a more specific thesis statement and a more specific uh, content and, and sort of getting your thoughts in order. But I really like you to brainstorm, think big, and you can always go small. But that's why I think it's always good to meet with me or somebody else to help focus your ideas. Um, here are Aristotle's virtues again. If you wanted to go over those virtues, temperance, courage, if you want to, um, I don't know, apply them to your own life or apply them to liberal arts education as intercultural and international. And it, I mean, if your main thesis would just be these classical virtues are a really good reference point for trying to develop an international global civilization or something like that. So if you wanted to do that, or, I mean, you could write a whole paper on, you know, um, even temperedness or rational friendships, if you decide to do that, if that is just something that you really care about, or the political virtues. Um, you could write a whole paper about uh, all around the world, supposedly we're trying to cultivate democratic societies, but we don't cultivate the qualities of character that you absolutely have to have to think like a citizen. And so we only appear to have more free and open societies. We don't really have them because we don't even know <laughs> what kind of people you have to have in order to develop and preserve that kind of society. And so you could easily make a paper about how absolutely ignorant uh, people in the world are about what it really takes to have a flourishing society and how educational systems throughout the world do not provide the education that students need. Um, just basic education for citizenship. Um, and, and these qualities of character are true for any country, right? So learning about citizenship isn't memorizing your constitution or figuring out, you know, I mean, I do think it's important, the executive branch and the cabinet in my country, but 
there's these other generic characteristics within the context of which you study your own particular country. So if you wanted to do something like that, another thing you might want to do is you remember the intellectual virtues. These are the ones that you study in most of your classes. And, and you could say, you know, the Greeks understood that if you don't, that those intellectual virtues can get tied to either virtue or vice. And that matters a lot. And so the difference between going to a university where they don't care, they don't make value judgments, you just go and get these skills and going to a liberal arts education where you're supposed to be working on your character, you know, makes a lot of difference. So if you wanted to write about uh, the split between intellectual virtue and moral virtue in the world today and how that's a serious flaw in the educational systems throughout the world. You can do that if you want. I know Louis, um, I always have some students that are really very aware of that. That's something they, it, it's close to their heart. Okay, so any of those themes coming off of that then I had that letter that I sent about, oh yeah, I was gonna talk, okay. It was about how COVID, um, yeah, okay, I talked about that. Think of all the ways women are asked to compensate for or fix problems, okay. So this one is sort of like COVID and it, it was this huge obstacle, right? So that was when everybody headed home and the students are afraid and whatever. So this is just kind of, you have to get your Artemis in gear. You have to get your Athena going. You have to, and I just gave some example, Aphrodite, Persephone. And so if you wanted to do that, you could do that. Um, all right, so there was one other thing I was gonna talk to you about with, um, with, I go back to those gods and goddesses and talk about Socrates. So Socrates is like Hestia because remember Socrates asks other people, what do they think, right? And so that's like Hestia. She tries to kindle the flame, the light of reason in the people she's talking to, right? She doesn't tell them what to think or try to get them to do stuff. She just tries to kindle the flame, right? That's what Socrates is trying to do. And I think Plato knows that. The other thing about Socrates, it says in the Apology, he didn't want to go into public life. Well, that's he didn't want to have a seat on Mount Olympus. He wanted to stay in the private life, which is Hestia. She stays at home in the heart. So I think I think a Greek would know that right away. They would identify right away. And then in the Phaedrus, in the middle of it, in the myth, it talks about Phaedrus, Socrates is trying to get his attention. And the philosophical frenzy, he wants to um, help Phaedrus understand which god is his daimon. And he says, uh, for the followers of Zeus, um, they find each other, they're soulmates, and then they go and pursue justice together, and the followers of honor, and the followers of whatever. So, I mean, Plato links the mythology back to those sacred passions after the Athenians have totally lost track of what their tradition was. And Socrates is just the vision carrier, right? He just helps each one find out what's your passion. Um, and so he talks to Glaucon and Adimantus in the Republic. Those are Plato's brothers. And Glaucon is into honor. He's the Timocrat. Uh, Adimantus is into money. He's the oligarch. And then Plato was into the love of wisdom. But he talks to other young people. So he's trying to get them to move up. So he's like the vision carrier. He was also compared, he always said he knew a lot about Eros and he was compared to Mar Marcellus, uh, who is a Dionysian sort of figure. So Socrates, even though he's very calm and 
um, even tempered and things. He he does. Alcibiades compares them to a Dionysian um, character because the frenzy, like philosophy, you can be passionate about philosophy, and it's it's like a craziness. It's a kind of mania. Um, so um, so the question of Athena, what is justice? So Socrates knows what justice is. He knows what it means to be a good citizen, even if he doesn't want to get out there and, and be the leader. He understands how to talk about these things and how to guide. His position was to be a guide for leaders and an educator of the youth. And that was the position of teachers at liberal arts schools. Um, the monks during the medieval times they provided guidance to rulers, anyone who asked, and then they educated the privileged class, the future leaders of the society. That was true for centuries. I think it is still true in a way, or it ought to be true. I mean, we're kind of losing it. Well, we are losing it because we have mostly universities, research universities with highly specialized research. So we're losing this sort of whole person kind of education for the whole person is um, getting lost and we're running out of money. A lot of small liberal arts schools are closing, so it's bad. Um, so, and then Hera, remember Socrates really knows what's worth honoring. Um, Socrates says he acts like a father figure to these young men. So he's kind of like the um, Demeter right? Taking care of them when their fathers are gone. Um, let's see. Socrates uses reasoning, but he's not immature like Apollo. Um, the sophists use reasoning also. Um, Lysias was very good at articulate, at making a speech, which is reasoning, but he was corrupted. His desires were corrupted. Um, let's see. So um, I guess that's that's it. But in the back of their minds, you know, the uh, Athenians, the Greeks would understand. Um, well, then um, they would understand that Socrates is like Hestia, and then you, the reader of the of the dialogue, it tries to trigger your mind, and then you take the torch, right? Whatever it is that lit you up and you go out and pursue your sacred passion in the world, whatever that might be, right? It's not very likely to be Hestia. Uh, there's a few of them that go back and become philosophy professors. But most of my students, I didn't have one student that went and got a PhD in philosophy because I don't know one philosophy teacher that thinks of it the way I think of it. So I had no idea who they would study with and they would probably fail because the teachers don't like you if you don't agree with them, which is very unphilosophical. But um, anyway, so that's, that's it for now. And I will see you. I mean, I, I will give you an email after we have this meeting because it is very confusing to have two whole class days listed on the attendance sheet and yet there's no class. So I will um, try to clarify that. But I would like you to come on during that time and we can have some conversations just wrapping up the class. Probably won't be a whole hour, you know, the hour and 40 minutes. But um, I think partly just to keep you focused Partly, I really hope somebody has ideas that they share and it isn't just me rambling. Um, but I would like to ask you to do that unless I'm not supposed to and then I'll send you an email to that effect, okay? Okay, right. Professor, um, before you go, um, we have something for you. So oh. everyone, if you are ready, then yeah. Yeah, we are ready. Okay. okay. Uh, ready. Maybe. Aw. Oh. <laughs> well, that's nice. Oh, that's nice, you all. Oh my gosh, I see your faces for the first time. This is terrible. 
I'm so sad that I, right? I mean, it's going to be so embarrassing when I get to campus and I will not, you're going to have to, <laughs> you're going to have to introduce yourself. It's just going to be bad. Uh, but thank you. I mean, honest to goodness. Thank honestly, you, Professor. I admire all thank of you. you so I, much, Professor. Thank of you so course. much, Professor. <laughs> your face. I can see your face. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Ma'am, take one picture uh, for us with you, then you will send by email. Okay, someone's going to take a picture? Yeah, I, I can take a picture for you guys. Okay, well, don't put the sign, you know, put the sign where I can see your face, okay? <laughs> I want to see your face. Oh, that's so nice. I swear to God, I admire all of you so much. I'm so spoiled compared to you. Uh, it's embarrassing, but I'll try to give back, you know? I'll do what I can. Also, the other faculty at AUW also are really amazing. They don't let you know it, I'm sure. A lot of them hide, but they're all great to get to know. Officer, you are... I mean, I love the way you teach. I love the way you yeah. um, want everything. I mean that you are uh, one of the best professor I have ever had in, in AUW. Um, I feel less pressure. I feel happy. I feel so much interested. Each and everything is amazing in this class. <laughs> Thank well, you, dear. So. I do want y'all to do well, right? I really do with all my heart. Um, I can't believe I get paid to do this job, <laughs> right? But, but really so many people helped me get this degree that I really wanna give back, right? And everybody who helped me get my degree would be very happy if I, right, pass it down, carry it down, right? To the next generation. Um, and I'm so happy I'm going to be able to go home and maybe one day you can Zoom me and I'll introduce you to my grandchildren. How's that? It will be really good. Uh, that would be great. Oh, it's nice to see your faces. I just, <laughs> I just wish I could remember your papers relative to your faces, but I guess it's hopeless for most of you. Um, so don't our faces and name if we uh, will suddenly meet with you in AWS. okay that's right yeah you show me your face when you meet with me one on one and then there's hope <laughs> yes ma'am sure. thank you thank you professor thank you thank you for everything professor well thank you for hanging in there yeah, Professor, uh, I really miss your classes because of uh, uh, I am not uh, facing stress. Also, your classes I always enjoy. Well, that's good. I I wished we could have had more small groups, you know, because when you're on campus, you can do that. Um, but you just hang in there. You'll get there, and you'll um. I'm sure you'll cherish every minute once you get back on campus, right? You won't, you won't, you know, complain about another student or something. You'll just value what you have. I'm so amazed you guys can stay focused under with all the obstacles. Oh my goodness. I'm always bragging about you to my, my friends over here. <laughs> there's me and there's we and there's okay untari all right untari was talking about ache and all this other stuff and i'm oh i remember ache and i remember this uh i went to bali untari i had a great time in bali for about a i don't know i went to ubud and have I'm you been there? there, Professor? Have you been there? Um, not yet. 
Okay. Well, it's normally where rich people go, so I didn't think I'd have fun. But actually, I got a cheap place to stay in somebody's house, and I did a lot of hiking. So I did stuff that wasn't what the rich people do, and it was great. I mean, you guys, there was this retreat center, you know, in Bali for people that are learning to meditate or they, they're, you know, they broke up, you know, their marriages fell apart or something. And so, but they mean the cost of these things is just phenomenal. So it's just a bunch of rich people feeling sorry for themselves as far as I can tell. <laughs> eh. Uh, but it's great. I, I always wanted to go visit some of the homes of my students at AUW, but then I got, um, I get these coughing attacks from being allergic to dust. So I probably can't do it, which makes me really sad. Um, but we'll see, time will tell. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any other questions about the class? Okay, so. Not yet, Professor. It's just kind of, the main mantra is one post a day, you know? <laughs> just count back, how many more do you have to do? You have till May 10th and just count backwards and, and that's what you have, so. So how are you doing in your other classes? Is everybody doing okay? You gonna survive? Yes, there are a lot of assignments and like exams and research papers in other classes. Like we are trying a lot. Like for me, like it's really hard to manage, but I'm telling myself that um, in two more weeks, I can like relax. So I'm trying. Yeah, actually for my class, I always tell the students, try to think that two, two weeks from now, you'll actually know more than you know now, right? <laughs> don't just hold your breath and go, oh, I don't even wanna think, I just wanna do it. Don't do that. Say, okay, now I'm gonna think. Um, yeah, okay. Professor, we are always trying our best. Yeah, I, I know you are, it's amazing. Um, well, I, I'm sure you understand why the teachers really love teaching at AUW. There aren't, there aren't people that smart off in the back, uh, <laughs> in the back row, right? There, <laughs> I don't know. Did you have discipline problems in high school? Did you have students that just sort of acted out? or you all went to really good high schools maybe. Um, but I'm really, I, it's so obvious all of you understand the power of education, right? Especially for women. Um, so I remember 30 years ago, I was reading articles about overpopulation, right? Because I wasn't even thinking I was gonna have children because I was so aware of environmental problems, population. So um, I read about the best way to, to slow population growth is to educate women in developing countries. Bravo. <laughs> so that's true, right? Most of you probably just wanna have one or two kids because maybe two, but I mean, not a whole lot of kids because you know those couple will be healthy and they'll be able to get an education. That was the idea. Instead of having nine kids and hoping a couple of them live to take care of you in your old age, you can you know, have a couple and then you can just rest assured that they'll be okay, right? Does that make sense to a lot of you? That was the philosophy. And I'm sure that was a philosophy behind AUW. So. 
Okay, Professor, I think and now we can say bye bye. <laughs> I know you do have a life. You do have to go. You probably have another class, a lot of you. Um, yeah, thanks, Professor. Take care, Alois. Thank you. Bye, bye, Professor. Bye. bye, Professor. Thank you. Bye, bye, -bye. Professor. Bye bye. Here's Pondama and Tari. Fahima. Hi, Fahima. <laughs> Hello, Professor. I'm glad to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. I, I'm really happy. I was just um, seeing you, but uh, I could not just turn on my video due to the internet. And yeah, we decided from yesterday to show our thank you note. That's why oh, that's nice. I think, yeah, we could all manage turning on our video today. Um, and so much happy to, um, to be in your class, Professor. I really appreciate. Well, <laughs> I, love I, your right. <laughs> I just really admire my students so much. I think they're great. Um, 